welcome to another edition of the UK Law Weekly podcast with me, your host, Marcus Cleaver. This week we're going to be looking at the Scottish case of AB and Her Majesty's Advocate. The citation for this case is 2017 UKSC 25. The main person in this case, AB, is now a young man, but when he was 14 he showed pornographic material to a young boy and also exposed his penis to three young girls. As a result of this, he was charged with two charges of lewd and libidinous practices at common law, and one contravention of Section 6 of the Criminal Law Consolidation Scotland Act 1995. However, although AB was charged with these particular crimes, he was not actually prosecuted. Moving forward a few years, and in 2015, AB was now 19, and was charged with having sex with a girl who was 14 years old, and this is contrary in Scotland to section 28 and 30 of the Sexual Offences Scotland Act 2009. As part of his defence to this um, allegation, he wanted to rely on a defence found in section 391A of that same 2009 Act, and this basically says that he reasonably believed The girl was 16 at the age of sexual intercourse, in other words she was old enough to give consent. However, under section 39.2a.1, this defence is not available if the person has already been charged with a quote, relevant sexual offence, and these offences are listed in schedule 1 and cover a range of sexual offences, some of which are consensual, some are non-consensual, Some are to do with the age of the victim and others are not, so there's a broad range of sexual offences that preclude the ability to use that defence that's found in section 39. Part of the list also includes the offences which AB was charged with when he was 14 years old, and so he was not able to use that reasonable belief defence. AB argued that the unavailability of this particular defence breached his rights under the European Convention on Human Rights. In particular, he alleged that there was no presumption of innocence and this was in contravention to Article 6.2 of the Convention. There was also a breach of his right to privacy under Article 8. And also in relation to that lack of privacy, um, discrimination under Article 14. Her Majesty's Advocate, who is the other party to this case, justified the law as it currently stands by saying that it protected children from sexual exploitation and the prior charge effectively acts as a warning for offenders, and therefore justifies the reasonable belief defence not being available for future offences. The case made its way through the Scottish legal system, and then got to the Supreme Court, which is where we are picking it up today. The justices of the Supreme Court began by dismissing AB's appeal in relation to Article 6, the right to a fair trial. Under section 39 there is still a presumption of innocence, and that's the key question here. There's still that presumption of innocence overall, and with respect to the reasonable belief defence, there is not an irrebuttable presumption, and effectively what is happening in this circumstance is that there is the creation of a strict liability offence. Therefore, even though it might be considered to be relatively harsh to remove that particular defence in those circumstances, Under Article 6, there is simply not a breach because there is still a presumption of innocence overall. It's quite useful at this point to have a reminder that Article 6 cases are more often than not to do with the actual procedure that's involved in a criminal trial, rather than the substance of the offence itself, which is what we're focusing on here, so it's not too surprising that that Article 6 challenge failed. However, AB did have much more success in relation to Article 8. It might be unusual to think that Article 8 is actually relevant here, um, because often the privacy cases are to do with people's privacy actually being invaded, and so its relationship to this particular criminal trial does seem unusual. However, because the prosecution is relying on prior criminal charges, there is an impact on privacy, and so Article 8 is actually triggered. Now when we're thinking about these earlier charges, in relation to AB they did not actually offer any warning as regards the current offence that AB is being prosecuted for, so it's clear that the justification that was provided by Her Majesty's Advocate 
does not actually stand up and there is incompatibility with Article 8. In other words, the unavailability of that particular defence is not really a deterrent and the prior charges aren't really a warning if they don't act as such. In fact, the Supreme Court went on to say that the list of the relevant sexual offences in the 2009 Act is so broad that there are a wide range of scenarios where a previous charge will offer no warning whatsoever for the more recent offence. And it's this that makes the interference with Article 8 disproportional. We obviously remember that Article 8 is not an absolute right to privacy, it does have to be balanced against other factors, but the disproportionality involved here means that there is a clear breach of AB's rights to privacy under Article 8 of the Convention. So AB was successful, but it's worth having a look here at the um, actual effect of the decision by the Supreme Court, because this is quite an interesting constitutional question. We're dealing here with an act of the Scottish Parliament rather than a UK act. If we were dealing with a UK act, then the judges would only be able to issue a declaration of incompatibility, which is available under the Human Rights Act 1998. But the Scotland Act 1998 gives the court much more power in this particular circumstance, and so when a provision is found to be incompatible, it is deemed to be outside of the competence of the Scottish Parliament to actually make that law in the first place. Effectively, the court is striking down a piece of legislation which is quite unusual within the English legal system, um, and certainly within the UK legal system as a whole. Therefore, the overall result is that Section 39.2a.1 of the Sexual Offences Scotland Act 2009 was invalidated by the Supreme Court, and the case will return to the High Court of Justiciary in Edinburgh. Overall, I think that we can say that this is probably a correct decision, as it seems a rather arbitrary way to decide if a defence is going to actually be available to a defendant, especially basing it on their previous charges, when those charges exist in such a wide range and might have nothing to do with that more recent offence, as the Supreme Court justices discussed. Nevertheless, it's not hard to understand the actual rationale for introducing this policy in the first place, as you don't want to take a soft approach to those repeatedly accused of sexual offences, especially when those offences do involve children. However, from a legal point of view and in the interests of fairness, it's important that such restrictions on criminal law defences are not painted with too broad a brush, as was the case here, because it will regularly produce unfair results that are in breach of people's human rights. Well, thank you very much for listening to this podcast episode. Thanks as ever to bensound.com who provide the theme music. If you do get a chance, remember to rate and review the podcast on iTunes and also check out my website, uklawweekly.com. Thanks very much for listening. Bye!